With the risk of sounding like something of a hypocrite, don't ever drink and drive. And don't worry, this isn't some sort of public service announcement or anything. I've just learned a lot since those events some years back. For the most part, it didn't happen often, getting behind the wheel after knocking back a few. Life just had a habit of giving me reason to get myself plastered. Well, that's what I would tell myself to defend my actions, anyway. Rough days at work would often send me straight to the bar before heading back to my home. Usually, I'd only have one or two before making the return trip, but days like I had that particular day sort of required a little more numbing ointments, as it were. Maybe halfway into my shift at work, my manager jumped me out of the blue. This report, or that, wasn't on her desk exactly when she had demanded it, so she took the time to chew my ass out, like the dog who just ate her favorite slippers in front of the whole damn office. It was a bad joke of a job, truth be told. The pay was not exactly inspiring. The majority of my co-workers had little to no personality, and the work itself was beyond tedious. Perhaps I should have at least taken the time to consider my actions, but I knew if I stuck around, I would have likely said or done some things that would only have escalated the whole ordeal, so I just grabbed my things and stormed out. Of course, my boss was still screaming at me after I kicked the door open, but I just had enough. I didn't know if I would still have a job the next morning, and I honestly didn't even care at the time. I didn't head straight to the bar from my place of employment that day. I always had a bit of a short fuse, so I knew all too well that my normal anxiety medicine would likely have gotten me into more trouble than I needed, so I just headed home. Ruby and I had been together for a while now. Well, long enough for her to spend most of her time at my place, anyway. I had left her sleeping in my bed that morning when I headed to work, so I assumed she would likely still be there. I was not wrong. She wasn't alone, either. Jake Peterson, her high school boyfriend, of all things, was seemingly attempting to exercise a demon from her crotch when I walked in. Are you fucking kidding me? I yelled when I walked through the door. The bastard didn't even stop. Oh yeah, she was scrambling like a damn headless chicken to pull herself off his face, but he just kept going. Sure, I could have kicked his ass. I could have thrown both of them out into the street and told her to never even think about coming back, but I just turned around and squealed my tires out of there. Truth be told, I knew she was, well, promiscuous when we met. I was just as much to blame, truth be told. She hooked up with me while she was still shackled up with some other poor schmuck. I had never given it a second thought until then, if I'm being honest, probably karma, all things considered, but I didn't care at the time. At that moment, I just wanted to get hammered. There are a lot of really good reasons not to drink alone, one of which is that there's nobody to tell you when to quit. Bradley, the bartender, knew me well enough by then, but we didn't have that movie bartender relationship. We didn't exactly shoot the shit or anything. No asking how my day was or what drove me to the bottle today and whatnot. He knew my face, I think he knew my name, but we just had that couple of bucks tip sort of relationship. I didn't feel the need to do him any favors, and he wasn't going to do me any either. He didn't care too much that I seemed fit to get plastered. I didn't either, for that matter. I probably spent the next three hours on that same bar stool. I doubt I could even form a legible sentence by that point, but Bradley kept handing me drinks, and I kept knocking them back. It wasn't until I got up to go break the seal that I realized how completely foobard I was. When I returned from the restroom, I grabbed my jacket and headed out to the car, scratching the hell out of my door handle trying to get my key into the lock. Of course, I hadn't even locked the goddamn thing, so that just pissed me off even more when I finally was able to turn the key. I got in my beat-up silver Nissan and started back out. My head was spinning like a son of a bitch, so when the horn blasted from the large red truck behind me, I thought it best to hold up for a moment to compose myself. I considered, for a moment, trying to sleep it off a bit right here, 
but I didn't want to end up getting myself kicked off the property for loitering or something, so I backed back out and hit the road. My plan was to head to my friend Brett's house and see if I could crash there for the night. He was a good guy, and he'd had to hang out at my place for a variety of reasons over the years. I didn't have many friends, really, as I kept to myself for the most part, but Brett and I had been close since high school. Not to mention I could take back roads to get to his place, most of which would be deserted that late, too. Empty roads would be my best chance of not getting myself arrested or inadvertently swerving into oncoming traffic on the way. The downside, though, it was a good 30-minute drive to get there. This wasn't the first time I had driven in this state, and I was sure it wouldn't be the last, so I cut down Decker Street to start my trip. I had been driving for a good 15 minutes or so when I noticed the headlights behind me. Now, I don't know if you've ever gotten behind the wheel after knocking back a healthy amount of alcohol, but every single headlight you see is without a doubt a cop when you're intoxicated while driving. I stiff-elbowed my steering wheel and focused on keeping my car straight to the best of my ability. I don't know how fast I was going, but the lights behind me were on me within seconds. I was certain they were running my plates and just waiting for me to give them a reason to flip the blue lights on. I mean, they were right on me. I couldn't even see their headlights anymore since we were practically bumper to bumper. All I could make out was the glow from behind and my shadow on the road in front of me. I glanced at my speedometer, all three of them, according to my inebriated vision at the time. I think I was going 35, so I gassed it a bit. I sped to about 50 miles per hour, but the lights still almost touched my rear bumper. I thought about slamming on my brakes and allowing them to eat my tail end, but that would most certainly get me locked up if it was the police. Finally, the lights backed up some, before the same large red truck from the bar whipped right around me. I could have sworn it clipped my bumper, too. I spilled a mass of obscenities from my lips while barely paying attention to the road. I listed every way I'd lodge my size 12s up the driver's ass if I caught up with him when I saw some sort of fork in the road I had never noticed before. I had no time to react, even if I wasn't seeing triple. I slammed my brake pedal to the floorboard, but still slammed right into the embankment before everything went dark. I woke up some time later. Blood had streamed down the center of my face from where my head had impacted the windshield. Seatbelts are often another thing that seems to get neglected when getting into a car while hammered. My neck was stiff as hell, and I still wasn't seeing clearly at all. I went to open my door, but it wouldn't budge. The blood in my eyes combined with my head still being incredibly foggy, it almost looked as though another car was beside me. I slid over to the passenger side, only to have the same results when I attempted to push open that door. I was sure I hadn't collided with another car. Even off my ass drunk, I knew the difference between hitting a mound of dirt and grass and another vehicle. The windshield was already cracked into spiderwebs from where my head had made contact, so I shifted myself around in the seat a bit and kicked the glass out the rest of the way. I worked my way through the opening and slid down across the hood. It was pitch black outside. There were no street lamps, no moon shining down from above, and all of the lighting my car would normally be capable of producing had been snuffed out by the impact, so I could barely see anything. Still, it felt as though it took considerably more effort than I would have thought just to slide across my hood. When I finally made my way to the ground, I looked back to see how bad of a shape my car was in. I was most definitely quite scatterbrained. I was seeing triple, and then some. I couldn't make out much, given the darkness which hid most everything from me, but it almost appeared as though there were a veritable herd of crumpled silver Nissans. I had no idea which of the cars was actually mine, or which were only drunken mirages. I swore under my breath, while my head still spun, so I attempted to figure out my options. This would be the downside of back roads. Sure, I could stick around where my demolished vehicle sat and hope somebody drove by, but I still wasn't prepared to face the law in my current state, so I decided to just start walking back the way I had come. 
I had passed a small town some miles back, so I hoped there may be somewhere I could take up lodge for the night. I was maybe a mile up the roads when it dawned on me to check my cell phone. Naturally, no service. I can't say that didn't surprise me, given everything else this day had resented me with. Still, I hoped I could actually catch a break soon. After waiting a little over an hour, I finally began to see signs of life. To my excitement, it looked to be some sort of diner, which was simply named Restaurant. This would be on the outskirts of the town I was seeking out, but I was certain it had been closed up for the night when I drove by. I must have been out for a while. Still, if I made it here, I hoped that perhaps a hotel would not be far off. At that point, I just wanted something to eat. The place looked like any generic diner off the beaten path, nothing special or particularly distinctive, just a grubby little roadside eatery. I walked in and immediately made my way to the restroom to clean myself up, while also making sure I wasn't too messed up. I glanced in the mirror, swearing under my breath again. I had a decent-sized gash right at my hairline. My left eye was swollen a good bit, and my face was caked in dried blood. The wound had stopped bleeding, at least. I watered some paper towels and held them under the faucet to clean myself up with. It stung like a son of a bitch when I pressed the moist paper rag against the wound, but it didn't start oozing fresh blood, so that was something. Once I was cleaned up, as well as I could be, without a fresh set of clothes to change into, I finally left the restroom, took a seat to the nearest two-person booth, and grabbed the menu. I couldn't make out a word on the page. It was a simple, laminated sheet of paper, with pictures of a variety of generic dishes and drinks, but I did not recognize the language of the text written upon it. I glanced around to see if anyone else was having any sort of trouble, but amidst the four or five other people whose company I now shared, all were just eating away, while staring off into whatever daydream suited them. A pretty blonde waitress with bright blue eyes came strolling up to my table. Was Connick for his ever common? She asked. I say, asked, because the sentence ended with that higher pitch the voice makes when asking something. Other than that, I hadn't the foggiest idea what she was saying. Don't even ask me how I remember what she said. Excuse me? She looked slightly alarmed for a moment before repeating the same question, though stuttering ever so slightly. Being completely lost, but more hungry than anything, I just pointed to the burger on the menu. She just nodded, made a note, and walked off. My stomach was churning. Between the accident and the only thing lingering in my belly being the remains of what I'd chugged down at the bar God knows how long ago, I desperately needed to get some food in me. Around ten minutes later, a large, bald man in an apron with equally as bright eyes as the waitress approached. He had some similar features as well, as what little hair he had left was also blonde. I assumed they were perhaps a family-owned diner, given the resemblance. He placed a plate with a very tasty-looking burger in front of me. It smelled wonderful. My stomach beckoned for me to start eating it from the second it arrived. Er undir vas andras? He asked, I think. Having visited many restaurants and diners in my day, it wasn't hard to assume he may have been asking if I wanted anything else. A drink would have been nice, but given the waitress' expression when I spoke, I chose to just shake my head. There was something strange about the place and its people, but I just blew it off as some sort of theme diner or something. Perhaps it was some manner of roadside tourist attraction, though I wouldn't exactly call this city a hotspot for travelers. I finished my wonderful burger and gave a nod to my initial pretty waitress when she looked at me holding up what I presumed to be the bill. When she handed it to me, I just gave her a twenty and said, Keep the change. Direct Hilfe? She replied, with a slight frustration in her tone. Though I can respect staying in character, I was growing steadily more frustrated with the whole ordeal. I'm so sorry. Uh, can you just speak English? She gasped before ripping the twenty out of my hand and practically sprinted towards a room in the back of the diner. Having decided my business here was concluded, I got up and made my way to the exit. 
Before I had a chance to push the door open, the large, balding man rushed me and pushed me up against the wall to the left of the door. Whoa there, big guy. He held up the twenty I'd given the waitress and repeated, Direct Hilfe, pushing me harder against the wall. What the hell, man? I barked, pushing him back. He gathered himself for a moment before he sped back at me, rearing back to take a swing. Having mostly recovered from my drunken state, I was able to dodge his attack fairly easily. He was a big guy, but his movements were not swift in the least. I took a quick jab at his gut, causing him to buckle over. The waitress pushed me towards the door. Go! She screamed, pointing at the door before leaning down to help the big fella who was now on his knees. The hell with this! I said, while pushing him through the door. It wasn't until I got outside, walked off the sidewalk and looked back, that I noticed the schwatzdika adorned flag blowing on a short flagpole mounted on the roof of the building. I stepped backwards away from the building when I heard a car horn behind me. I whipped around to see a black sedan pulling into a parking space whose driver was yelling what I assumed to be obscenities out of his driver's side window at me. It sounded like the same language the waitress spoke, so he could have been giving me anything from a threat to no more than a friendly reminder to keep an eye out for moving cars in a goddamn place of business for all I knew. He definitely sounded quite aggravated, regardless of what he may or may not have been saying. While I was considering my luck with almost being nailed by other cars in parking lots of late, the man in the trench coat caught my eye. It was one of those old-timey movie private detective coats. It was that beige color with the extra flaps over the shoulders. You know the kind, right? He was even wearing the dark brown fedora to complete the look. He was standing on the other side of the road, just staring at me while smoking a cigar. He looked pretty tall, from what I could tell from a distance away. I couldn't see his face all that well, as the coat was buttoned and belted, and his collar was pulled up. The fedora was cocked at a light angle, sitting low on his brow. What little I could make out of his face looked aged and wrinkled. We stared at each other for a few moments before he reached a hand up to pull the cigar from his mouth, while pointing towards the restaurant with his pinky finger. I turned to see the big guy inside talking on the phone while pointing in my direction, as if what I presumed to be the police on the other end of the line could see what he was gesturing towards. That was my cue to get the hell away from there. I turned to give a grateful wave to the 50s P.I. across the road, but he was nowhere to be seen. I just shrugged it off and took off running back down the road in the direction of my mangled car. I wasn't exactly sure what that place was, but I wanted to be long gone before whoever they called would show up there. For all I knew, it could have been some white supremacist neo-Nazi friendly diner whose employees really got into character, and what I thought to be cops on the phone were just some good old boys coming to beat my ass black and blue. Too many questions, and I'm not waiting around for answers, I thought, and just kept running until my side started splitting. After a good thirty minutes of traveling away from the strange diner, I came across a small barn next to a dilapidated house. Having realized some moments earlier that I was beyond exhausted, I decided to take a look and see how deserted it actually was. The hinges squealed like an angry boar when I pushed through the shoddy door on the barn. It smelled like old wood and centuries old dust and dirt. There were old bales of hay and a dirty horse blanket lying by the back wall. Good enough. I kicked at the bales to make sure no critters were hiding out within them before snatching up the blanket and beating it against the wall. I coughed like an eighty-year-old two-pack-a-day smoker when a cloud of ancient dust blew back at me, but it didn't appear to be particularly filthy. I laid the blanket down across the bales, took off my jacket, rolled it into a makeshift pillow, and passed out as soon as my head made contact with it. It was one of my stranger dreams. I was that classic movie archaeologist with a leather jacket and hat. I was sprinting through a cave filled with obstacles, being chased by a battalion of Nazi troopers wearing aprons and chef's hats armed with butcher knives. I had just retrieved the ancient yet still fresh hamburger of Horus from the booby-trapped pedestal, 
I slung my whip around the tree roots while pushing their way through the roof of the cave before swinging across the huge gaping hole in the ground. A hole which opened to show jagged spikes in all shapes and sizes that would see fit to impale those who may seek to flee the cave with the sacred sandwich. Some of the pursuing Nazis attempted to jump the hole, only to fall to their bloody demise to the tune of many accented and amusing foreign-sounding swear words, accompanied by echoing Wilhelm screams. The remaining Nazis were crushed by the enormous spherical rock which had been in pursuit of them. I leapt through an opening as the rock violently lodged itself in the smaller mouth of the cave. As I regained my bearings and raised myself up from the ground, still clutching the delicious hamburger of Horus as tightly as I could without crushing it, I raised my gaze to the tall man in the tan coat and dark brown hat. He stood at twelve feet tall, at least. He looked down at me with bright orange eyes, which stared through the thin gap between his upturned collar and hat. They looked like flickering flames through the narrow opening. He held out a bony hand with unnervingly elongated fingers to take from me my sacred reward. As I outstretched my trembling hand, almost dropping the mouth-watering dish, there was an ear-piercing laugh, so high-pitched that I felt thick blood stream down from my ears. I jerked awake, momentarily confused by my location. I looked around with my eyes wide, halfway expecting to see the tall man glaring down at me while I still clung onto the burger. What the hell was that? I thought, shaking my head while laughing nervously. I dusted myself off, beat my jacket against one of the 2x4 support beams, and started back towards my deserted vehicle. Well, I hoped it was still deserted, anyway. It only took me a little over a half hour to make my way to a familiar turf. Luckily, the road had remained mostly quiet on my stroll, with the exception of a lone, two-seater blue sports car which came speeding towards where I strolled. I stepped into the trees off to the side of the road when I saw it approaching, as I thought it best to avoid anyone at this point. A few minutes later, I could see lights reflecting off what assumes to be my car in the distance. The closer I got to my poor, crumpled silver Nissan, I realized that there were far more than one vehicle at the fork in the road. Jesus, I thought. Had I actually hit another car and fled this scene? My heartbeat started to quicken. Had someone from the diner, that maybe a truckload of pipe-hitting skinheads, found my deserted wreckage? I started to slow my pace as the trembling in my knees made placing one foot in front of the other a little more difficult. The closer I got to my car, the more things looked quite bizarre. As I arrived at the fork in the road, at my broken heap of a car, things just did not look remotely real. What was before my eyes was a confusing cluster of cars. My car, or variations of it, anyway. It looked like a flower with too many petals, each one a somewhat altered copy of my silver Nissan. To make things even more strange, every respective rear end had its own road reaching from behind, each leading away from where the car made contact with the fork. They all overlapped in a way that was not physically possible. I could hear wind blowing from all directions, but I could only feel the breeze from the road on which I stood. This couldn't be real, could it? Now that's something you don't see every day, ain't it? The voice caught me by surprise. I think I even jumped a little, audibly gasping. I reluctantly turned to see the trench coat man from the diner standing behind me, leaning up against a tree by the side of the road I had approached from. He was still smoking a cigar and stood, to my reckoning, a good seven feet tall at least. He appeared to have a bit of bulk to him too, but that may have just been the baggy coat throwing off his proportions. It hung all the way to the concrete ground, covering his feet, making him look even more unnatural. Of course, nothing appeared remotely natural to me at that time. He began to walk towards me, revealing wide, brown shoes beneath the curtain of his coat. I slowly backed up until I felt my ass bump into one of the rear ends of the cars in the cluster. I suddenly felt wind from behind, in place of the breeze which had previously been aimed towards me. 
You take a look in any of those windows? His voice growled again as he nodded his head towards the car flower. It wasn't an unpleasant voice, but it did sound old, ancient even. It was graveled and worn, yet somehow strong and proud. I didn't want to take my eyes off of him, but I was now beyond curious what he was getting at. I turned my head towards the windshields, gasping once more when I saw my own corpse through a few of them. In one case, I had been ejected from the driver's seat, drooping halfway through the windshield and half onto the hood. In another, my face was pressed to the cracked glass, with bones protruding from my abnormally twisted neck. Some of the cars, however, were completely vacant. I looked around as though expecting to see my body lying on the ground, or plastered to a tree, but the way the cars were clustered in the center made it impossible to make out where one ended and another began. Crushed metal appeared to be almost superimposed over more buckled fenders and hoods. I reached my hands to where some of the vehicles met. As I passed my fingers over them, the wind changed direction over and between my fingers. Pretty crazy, right? The stranger remarked. What? Who are you? I asked, growing as curious about this stranger as the bizarre sights of the clustered Nissan. Now that, he replied, is a long story, taking a deep inhale of his cigar. Okay, fair enough. If you won't tell me who you are, can you tell me what the hell this is? I almost comically gestured to the pack of Nissans. By this point, the stranger was right on me. He may have been even taller than I had assumed, as he appeared to tower over me, as though I was little more than a child to him. He peered down at me through almost hypnotic eyes. They were not a flickering flame yellow like in my dream, but an almost neon lime green. They were mesmerizing to look at. I blinked rapidly, shaking my head in an attempt to regain my focus. I told myself I would not look into his eyes again, if I could help it. I didn't say I wouldn't tell you who I am. It can just be a bit difficult for folks like you to understand. Folks like me? I asked. I can't lie. I was butthurt. Did he just call me stupid? People like you, as in people in general, don't get all pissy now, he replied with a slight chuckle. I wasn't entirely sure what I thought at that moment. Part of me still wanted to confront him for talking down to me, but the other part was suddenly intimidated. People like me, as in people in general. Those words bumped around in my head as if I was trying to solve a complex mathematical equation. A plus 73 divided by X over 8 to the power of what the fuck? Did this guy just tell me he wasn't human? Now you're getting there. He said, as though he had delved into my mind. I could see more of his face now. His skin looked like leather. Not in the John Wayne riding his horse across the western plains sort of way, but it had that sheen and texture like he was something else hidden away behind a human face-patterned leather mask. Not in a southern chainsaw way, though. It wasn't gruesome, you know. It just... I, I don't know. Not right. It didn't look as though it had been sliced off someone else and tied around his head with a rubber band or anything. It formed to his features, hit his eyes and his mouth the right way, and moved like it was connected to his muscle tissue and such, but no, this was no person, and not one I've ever seen before, anyway. You can call me you, he said. Ed? Close enough. You see, kid he said, in a strong, almost country accent. This here is one of those places you don't see on no map or nothing. Ain't always here, you see. It could be there one day and somewhere else the next. It may be nowhere. He was pointing in multiple directions while he spoke, as though it was literally located just across the street on the first Tuesday of the month. I knew I must have looked like a complete idiot with the expression on my face. Slack-jawed and squinty-eyed, Still, I had grown comfortable with the idea that this guy, for lack of a better term, did not mean me any harm. But I was still all kinds of confused. Places don't move, do they? So, the fork isn't always here, I said, 
and more of a statement than a question. Ain't so much the fork as the... He seemed to be searching for the right word. Intersection. He smiled, looking like he'd just solved a riddle. Intersection? And not an intersection in the road, kid, he said, with a slight tilt of his head. It didn't feel condescending, and normally if someone kept calling me a kid, I would take offense, but I felt as though I likely was a child to this guy. An intersection between realities. Somewhere inside my cluttered head, I had a bad feeling this was what he was getting at. The word realities hit me in the gut like a sucker punch. I felt queasy and a little dizzy at the same time. Things like this aren't real, right? I had driven this road many times over the years and couldn't recall ever having seen a fork in the road. It was usually just a straight shot with a few lefts and rights here and there onto other back roads. I could see now that it wasn't a fork at all. This wasn't where one road met before splitting into two, but where many roads met. Why is this happening? How did I end up here? Am I lost forever? My brain was conjuring questions quicker than my mouth could catch up. Dumb luck, he said. When it shows up, it's gonna get you if you're close enough. How do I get home? He glanced towards the cluster. It looks to be. He was gesturing with his pointer finger while lip sync counting. About 24 cars here, he said, still gazing at the herd of Nissans. Looks like you got a 1 in 24. Well, 23, since I know you ain't going back down that road. A 1 in 23 chance of finding the right road. He looked almost proud of the math he'd just dropped in my lap. He reached down, picked up a small rock from the road, and scratched a large X across the concrete to indicate where I had already been. He tossed the rock towards me. I fumbled it between my hands before I caught it, looking at it and back at him, still wearing something of a bewildered expression. You can't give me anything better than that. Honestly, I didn't mean to sound ungrateful. I knew I shouldn't be this comfortable talking to whatever he was, but I did feel at ease with him, somehow. It was as though he were an old friend, in a strange sort of way. He cocked his head, making an expression that read like, Watch it now, to me. I'm sorry, man. I I truly am. I don't mean to act like an asshole. I'm just scared. I said, with way more honesty than expected. Truth be told, I was fucking terrified. The first reality I stumbled into was a Nazi-owned and operated version of America. What else could I be walking into? Look, he said, I ain't from around here. Like that was hard to figure out. I know this intersection. I've been through it myself. There was a strange look in his eye, aside from the strange look on his, well, him, I've studied it. I've tracked it. I've tried to understand what it is. He was looking around, almost mesmerized by it, perhaps in awe of it. I come from a place beside this world. Somewhere parallel, I suppose. Under the surface, maybe. This thing breaches through, gets into all the planes, all the layers. It's alive, I think. He stopped himself, darting his gaze back to mine. Remember where you came from? He said, almost demandingly. How'd the air smell? How'd the things sound? How'd they echo? He clapped his hands. We were still on the road to Nazi town. I didn't know if it was just because of his leather skin, large hands, or if it was indeed the effect of a different world, but the echo really did sound, uh, I don't know, off, I guess. I stomped my feet. Yeah, I said, nodding my head. There we were, this stranger and I. He was still clapping his hands while I was stomping my feet. We probably looked like we were at a goddamn hoedown. Okay, I said. I'm going for it, holding my hand out to shake his. He reached his hand to mine, and it suddenly hit me how far off his proportions were. 
His fingers wrapped around my hand like vines shooting from the possessed tree in that old movie about the evil cabin in the woods. His skin felt slick, but warm. I don't know if you'll make it back, kid. Likely you'll have to go through hell to get there. He gave me a strange sort of smile. Or perhaps it only appeared that way because of his, well, unique features. I gave him a nod waved a token goodbye, and headed towards the next road split over. Since the roads surrounded where the cars made contact with each other, I was able to walk beside each road's vehicle to reach the next one over, though I would have to crawl over conjoined hoods to get to the one across the way. Still, I wanted to be sure I didn't inadvertently walk down two separate paths at the same time. I hated to think what could happen if I straddled two realities at once. Before I made much distance, the trench coat man called out to me. If you see the red trees, run as fast as you can. I waved a dismissive acknowledgement and just kept on strolling down the road, stomping my feet while hoping to hear the right echo. I was maybe five or ten minutes down the road after establishing my footfalls sounded all right when I saw a vulture sitting on a branch that stretched out from a tree next to the road. Well, that's unnerving, I said aloud to myself. It looked down at me for a moment before it gave me a grin filled with large, square teeth which resembled the old school chewing gum. Nope, I said, immediately turning myself right back around. I made it back to the fork, scratched my X across the road before double checking to make sure the other one was still in place. As I started down the next road in line, I almost instantly noticed how soft the ground felt. There was no echo at all, as my stumps felt as though they were hitting a large, yet semi-firm pillow. Another X, and another down the road, though it took little more effort to scratch it across the surface of this one. This may not be so bad after all, I thought. I decided to take a few steps onto each road before wandering too far down any of them. It took a little while, but between that and the ones I had already ventured into, I was able to rule out a good fifteen or so. I found it interesting that the time of day was different down some of the roads. Some were already dark, while others had the morning sun beaming down on them. I couldn't exactly pinpoint what I thought the hour should be according to my internal clock, and my cell phone was acting very glitchy on my regular checks for service. Still, the quick inspection method had left me with around nine to go. I gave a heavy sigh as I stared across the roads ahead. Sure, I had ruled out a healthy amount of them, but there were still miles to go before I could sleep. The road I finally settled on sticking to sounded and appeared to check all the right boxes. My feet were aching by this point, but I kept plundering onward. Though it had only been some hours since I had awoken from the dead sleep I had fallen into in the abandoned farm on the outskirts of the Nazi town, I felt as though I hadn't rested in days. Truth be told, I wasn't actually sure how long it truly had been since then. Since my phone continued to glitch, I couldn't get a clear reading of the time of day. I couldn't tell if it was making a feeble attempt to connect to the towers of each respective world it traveled to in the comfort of my pocket, or if the intersection's reach extended far beyond the fork. While I took those few paces onto each of the roads at the fork, I kept glancing at my device, hoping it would reveal to me which was the one it belonged in, but no luck there. It could be that whatever power lies behind the fork had left a mark on my fairly undated phone. Who knows? Still, I would keep checking in hopes of seeing some sort of evidence that I was going the right way, though my battery would likely not last much longer. To my surprise, it only took me about 45 minutes to reach civilization. My head had been in the clouds for the majority of my stroll, so the time passed by more quickly than it had before. Of course, I couldn't be sure if the three quarters of an hour which had passed by according to my glitchy phone were entirely accurate. My newfound surroundings looked to be the same, somewhat familiar, small town. I had never paid much attention to this place, as I generally only passed through it on the way to Brett's house. There were a few stores scattered here and there along with another diner, 
The building was set up very much the same as Hitler's Bar and Grill from a few realities over, but I long since burned through the delicious burger and found my stomach gurgling its desires for more. If nothing else, I could see how the sight of my money affected the employees here. I wanted to establish the cash debate right through the gate, so when I walked in, I went straight to the bar and asked if I could get change for a dollar, holding out my crisp George Washington to the brown-haired guy with a goatee on the other side. Sure enough, he took it from my hand, giving me four equally Washington-embossed quarters in return. I took a long sigh before sitting down at another two-person booth. Still baffled by how modern-day Nazis put together such a mouth-watering burger, I ordered the same thing here. Luckily, the image on the menu was right next to English words this time. There was even a TV on the far right side of the bar, mounted to the wall. The news was on, which felt like a good excuse to tune in and compare the state of this world with mine, still very hopeful I had indeed found my way back home. The newscaster talked about potential vaccine protocols along with some other questionable decisions coming from the Oval Office. It certainly sounded where I came from, though I can't say I ever actually paid much attention to the news before. The guy who was slinging burgers behind the bar would glance up to the monitor from time to time before turning his gaze back to the open grill, shaking his head while muttering under his breath. My burger landed on my table, and I looked down at it with my mouth starting to water. I gave the waiter who took my order a smile and a nod before he headed back behind the bar. It was good. Really good. I hated to think it, but the Nazi burger may have still been better, though. Now that's something I never thought I'd say. Of course, it could have just been the effect of it being the first thing to hit my stomach after hours of binge drinking, making that meal especially tasty. I was wolfing down my delicious sandwich in between eating shoestring fries by the fistful when the TV caught my attention. Ruby, my cheating girlfriend, well, ex-girlfriend for damn sure now, popped up on the screen. Her picture, anyway. A young woman and her presumed lover were found murdered today in the apartment belonging to her boyfriend, the reporter said. Both victims were stabbed repeatedly and reported dead at the scene. I was staring. Slack-jawed at the TV, a half-chewed chunk of burger still laying on my tongue. This apartment is owned by a Richard Eugene Dorian, who is being sought for questioning in the apartment homicide. My picture appeared on the screen. My heart was thumping like a drum. Should anyone have any information about the location of this man, please contact your local police department. My picture remained on the screen for a minute or two before she moved on to the next topic. I whipped my head around the diner. Had anyone been paying attention? Did they notice me over here with a mouthful of half-chewed beefy goodness? There weren't many people in the diner. A couple who sat gazing into each other's eyes in a booth over by the far window, two older women sitting at the bar talking fifty miles an hour, and another guy on his own sitting in the back, playing on his cell phone. The cook was still muttering to himself while flipping burgers, and the guy at the counter was just blankly staring out the window. Having completely lost my appetite, I rolled the food in my mouth and my napkin, balled it up, and threw it on my plate. I tried to play it cool while I strolled casually to the bar. I laid a twenty down, to which the waiter popped open the cash register to fetch my change. Keep it, I said, turning on my heels, heading for the door. I pushed the door open just as a police car pulled up into the next parking space over. Just my luck. I just stood there, stunned for a moment. The officer riding shotgun looked right at me. We locked eyes for a second before I cut my gaze to the side while turning to walk in the direction away from the car. Hey! The voice called from behind me. I felt my whole body tense up, bracing for the impact of what was to come. I turned slowly to see the waiter from the diner. You forgot your change, bro, he said, waving a ten and two dollar bills at me. Keep it, man, I called back and kept moving. It was just a burger and fries, bro. I can't accept that, he called back, sounding genuinely taken aback by the larger than normal tip. You earned it, I called back, walking faster. Wait. Another voice called to me. Sure enough, it was the passenger cop, 
holding his hand on the gun at his hip. My mind went crazy. I hadn't killed them, had I? This couldn't be my world. It was similar. Uh, okay, it was fucking identical, but I know I didn't kill her. I was pissed when I walked in on her getting it on with her old boyfriend, but I would never do something like that, right? Before I could take the time to weigh the pros and cons, I took off into a sprint. Stop right there, the cop yelled before firing two shots. Warning shots, I hoped. I had to get back, back to the fork. I ran into the trees, hoping I could navigate my way through before they could get to me. Sirens blared from behind me, but I wouldn't look back. Eyes forward, keep running. My mind raced, as did my feet. I ran deep into the woods, attempting to get as much distance as I could from my pursuers. I heard car doors slam shut. They were on foot now, and odds are they knew these woods far better than I did. I had a good lead on them, though. That was something. I hoped I was still going in the right direction. I had been running for maybe ten minutes straight. I was sweating buckets, and my side throbbed like a son of a bitch. I heard what sounded like a motorcycle coming my way from the side. Damn it! I swore out loud. They were definitely going to catch up to me now. To my surprise, a kid, maybe twelve or thirteen, was speeding in my direction on a dirt bike. I waved my arms at him. Stop! Stop! He turned his helmeted head to look in my direction, losing his focus for a second. The bike appeared to hit a broken tree branch just the wrong way, causing it to topple and slide to the ground, throwing the kid rolling. Shit! I said, running to the kid. He was clutching his arm, wailing on the ground. I ran over to him to check if he was badly hurt. No visible injuries, other than a few scratches on his arms and legs. I'm pretty sure that arm was broken, though. He was wearing a helmet, but he only had a t-shirt and shorts besides that. I heard the cop's footsteps getting closer. I couldn't help. I didn't have time. I was a shitty human being. I knew it. I was a goddamn drunk and a selfish asshole. I couldn't blame her for cheating. I knew that much now. I'm so sorry, kid. I said. Help is coming. I ran to his bike, lifted it up, and went speeding away. Another in a long line of self-centered decisions, but I wasn't about to go to jail for a crime I didn't commit. I, I hoped I didn't commit it, anyway. I wasn't the most experienced rider by any means. The kid was very likely far beyond my years on this thing, but I was able to handle it if I didn't push it too far. I made for the direction of where I hoped the road was located. Within a couple of minutes, I cleared the trees, narrowly missing a car which sped by on the road. I hit the brakes, almost flipping the stolen ride. I sat at the edge of the road for a moment to gather my bearings, while maybe getting an idea of where I was. I could hear multiple sirens off in the distance to my left, so I knew that was not the direction I was headed. I sped off again, hoping to reach the fork before the police could catch up to me. They were on me in seconds. Maybe twenty feet behind me, two siren-blazing cars sped. I could see the shimmering light ahead of the sun reflecting off the car cluster at the fork. I knew if I slowed, they would catch me. They'd ram me right off the damn road if I gave them the chance. I gunned it. The fork was right ahead of me as I felt the front bumper of a car tap my back wheel. The bike began to skid, but somehow I was able to control it. Though I was speeding much faster than I felt comfortable with, I didn't have time to slow down enough to creep alongside the thin road beside the cars in the cluster. I made an attempt to pull the bike into a wheelie, hoping to make it over where the cars met in the center. Ultimately, I ended up flipping the bike over the conjoined hoods, sending me careening into a darkened road. I lifted my spinning head from the concrete for long enough to establish my pursuers had been unable to follow me down this path before everything went black again. When my eyes finally opened back up again, I became quickly aware of the pain my body was in. Whether it was from whatever new injuries this most recent accident had left me with, or simply the effect of waking up on solid concrete, I did not yet know. I slowly lifted my body from the ground. 
I had a few more scrapes and bruises than I had before I hauled ass away from the diner, but surprisingly it wasn't as bad as I would have thought, given the nature of what left me splayed out on the pavement. I could still hear the sirens behind me, but the sound was much more muffled now. I didn't know which road I was on at the time. I couldn't tell if it was one I had already ruled out, but I did make a token stomp to verify if the echo fit. I couldn't see much of anything, but I didn't really care at the time. The stolen bike was only a few feet from where I stood, but when I lifted it from the ground, I was once more surprised to find it still functioned. Somehow, neither my body nor my ride had been terribly damaged through this ordeal. Since I could still hear evidence of the police searching for me from the road I left behind, I didn't want to take any chances. Once I was able to make out that the road I was on didn't bear one of my marks, I mounted the bike and took off away from the intersection once more. I planned to keep speeding along until I found any signs of life. I flipped my bike's headlight on, and though it wasn't especially bright, it still gave me a clear enough view of the road before me. It occurred to me that it seemed as though I was the only one who could even see my multiple crashed Nissans, as well as accessing the roads which spread from them. Still, I wasn't taking any chances, even though my mind was still all over the place. All things considered, it did feel nice to have transportation again. I'm not sure how much gas these things held, but I hoped it would hold out until I was able to find where I belonged. It occurred to me that I didn't have a chance to mark the road I had just sped from, but perhaps there would be some tire marks from the police tearing through if I was forced to head back that way again. I wondered how it would look from their perspective, had I just vanished before their eyes. If I happened to stumble down that road again, would there be a horde of police cars awaiting me on the other end? God, I hope this is the right one, I said out loud. I didn't want to have to go back there. I had to get home. It took maybe twenty minutes for the road to reveal buildings ahead of me. The tires on my newly acquainted bike gave a loud scream when I slammed the brakes. I had been mentally checked out this whole time. Had I not been on autopilot due to my cluttered thoughts, I may have actually noticed what surrounded me. The headlights shone across the trees before me. Red trees. The woods on either side were a bright red. Well, they looked brighter through the soft light of my bike. Run. The trench coat man's voice echoed in my head. Before I could turn the bike around to speed back up the direction from which I came, I saw a strange silhouette some distance in front of me. I tilted the handlebars towards it to get a better look. What the light showed me caused my jaw to drop once more. Standing before me, maybe twenty yards away, was a tall, skeletal, I don't know, thing. It was far enough away that I couldn't make out any specific features, but it appeared to have short, pointed legs. I couldn't make out any sign of feet, only skeletal legs with multiple joints coming down to a sharpened, needle-like tip. The torso was twisted, in a way. It reminded me of a contortionist I saw on TV once. It was as if its lower torso was turned away from the upper torso, wrinkling the thin lining of flesh around it. The arms were similar to the legs, but twice as long. They had what appeared to be maybe three or four joints each. It was the head which had me transfixed, though. I still couldn't make out the facial features, but the eyes were a yellow-orange flame, not indifferent from what my bizarre dream had shown me. Though I had only just noticed it, it had apparently noticed me first. I couldn't look away, no matter how hard I tried. I fought to cut my eyes to the side, but I couldn't even blink. The thing shambled slowly towards me, though it had only appeared slow from a distance. The closer it got, the longer the arms and legs looked to be. They were making long strides, closing the distance between us faster than if I had pushed the gas as hard as I could on my newly acquired hog. Though my gaze was frozen, my mind wasn't. I was in full panic mode. I needed to get out of there. I needed to turn my bike around and speed back to the fork, even if it meant slamming right into the cops I'd only narrowly escaped. In my mind, I was spinning around and squealing tires, but in reality, whatever reality was anymore, I was frozen in place. The 
creature was right on me. I could now see the pure white and almost translucent skin that was pulled around the bony structure. It was tall, unsettlingly tall. Fifteen to twenty feet, if I had to guess. Its pointed legs and arms pierced through the ground where it stood, glaring down at me. My heart threatened to beat right through my chest. I just knew this would be the end for me. The monster lifted its lower extremities up before gently sliding them under my arms. It was as if it was being careful not to hurt me. Those things could have pierced right through my flesh like warm butter, but they only brushed tenderly under my armpits. It lifted me up softly with its legs, while still gently shoving the dirt bike to the side of the road with its right arm. It turned on the spot, not shifting its eyes from mine before it began to walk back towards the direction it had come from. With every step, it stabbed its arms into the ground while we just gazed at one another. At this point, I had no doubt I was going to die. The red trees I was warned to stay away from, the mutilated skeleton beast gingerly carrying me up the road towards God knows what. I would never see my home again. Nor would I have the chance to apologize to Ruby for being such a neglectful and self-centered fool. I was fucked. With the creature's long strides, it didn't take us long to get to what apparently qualified as civilization in this world. I was able to slightly cut my gaze from side to side ever so little, mostly through my periphery, but enough to take in my surroundings. To my surprise, once again... There was the reliable diner perched on the side of the road. This one, however, did not resemble any of those I had previously visited. The walls were not straight. Each one looked to be a different size and width. There were pointed pillars on either side of the front door, both of their own unique dimensions. The door looked more of a triangle than a regular-shaped entrance. This was not to be our destination, it seemed. Good thing, too. I thought. The burgers in this town would likely not be for me. We made our way along and up a slight hill, following a somewhat wavy and uneven path. Though I was technically facing backwards towards my escort, I could make out what lay ahead as we zigged and zagged. We moved up the hill and around a wide curve, surrounded by more twisted and bizarrely proportioned buildings, each with their own assortments of unsettling sounds echoing from inside. Various creatures of different shapes and sizes came in and out of oddly shaped entryways. Some tall, some short, some almost human in appearance, while others, well, not so much. The humanoid ones looked more of a parody of how a person may appear to a visitor from an alien planet. Bulbous heads and limbs hunched over in some cases, while some stood far more straight and upward than anything naturally would. There were creatures with no legs, somehow floating to their destinations, and others slithering across the ground, leaving thick, sticky trails behind them. In a strange way, this whole place made me think of some kind of carnival, or sideshow. Well, if they were located in the sixth level of hell, anyway. Though the creatures looked unnerving and unlike anything my mind had ever been trained to understand, they were not scary, not entirely so, anyway. I was being carried to the streets by a mutant, fleshy skeleton, after all. Still, this whole place made me think of a horror movie made for children. It didn't make sense, but didn't terrify me. I may have even begun to think it may be possible to survive this, after all. This was, at least, until we reached the vicinity of what was to be our destination. It looked as though a medieval castle and a deflated circus tent had a baby. There were vivid colors, some of which I had never seen before. And again, the agriculture looked completely nonsensical. Pointed pillars, jagged walls, wide openings in various places across the walls which did not appear broken, but designed that way. The whole thing almost looked as though it shouldn't physically be able to exist. As we drew closer to this unnatural building, I noticed the earth beneath my guide's pointed feet. It was a shimmering, silvery black... It appeared wet, almost, like the black formed circles and swirls in the silver-like water. When my bony taxi's arms would pierce through the surface, the ground would split and crack, 
before sealing itself back shut in its wake. As we approached the opening to this structure, I noticed something higher up on the hill which finally freed my gaze from the beast carrying me. It was an enormous, jet-black building. It felt entirely out of place behind this bizarrely warped place, as its walls were straight all the way up to the jagged and pointed steeples. Massive gargoyles peered down from the roof, looking as though they were ready to take flight off into the night. Everything was symmetrical, from the glossy black walls to the roof. There was something of a subtle movement to the thing as I gazed blankly towards it. It appeared to move ever so slightly, like rocks being tossed into a still, jet-black lake. I'm not sure why, but I wanted to go to it, like it was calling to me, inviting me. It was huge. It felt as though it was right beside me, as though I could reach right out and wrap my fingers around the doorknob. I finally came back to my senses when we passed through the opening to the bizarrely proportioned castle into an unnervingly wide, twisted hallway. My eyes were finally free to look around, being neither locked into my escort's fiery gaze nor the behemoth on the hill. I began to feel the fear settling in again as I looked to my side. People, fully human people, were being led down the same twisted hall which we traversed. Misshapen and tarnished metal collars around the necks of these poor individuals were connected by chains, with a tremendous muscled beast leading them onward. Some of the victims had fallen to the floor, being dragged along with the others. Their clothes were rags, and their bare feet were covered with blisters and scars. There were no moans or screams, though. No sounds you would relate with innocent victims being dragged by what appeared to be about 700 pounds of pure muscle wearing a loincloth and a hood. They hung their heads, but didn't appear to be suffering. Those being dragged appeared completely indifferent to their circumstances. Regardless of that fact, my fear had most definitely returned. Oh, it had returned, like a damn truck on fire. As the muscled giant pulled its flock down a neighboring hallway, my chauffeur and I continued on until the hall gave way to a massive room. It reminded me of throne rooms from old knights and dragons movies, but larger. Blood-red candles lined the walls, seemingly floating as they moved up and down in unnatural ways. The walls themselves were a glossy black. They were very different from the walls of the massive buildings on the hill, and not as unnaturally organic. They appeared a similar material to the silvery black ground, just without the silver flickering throughout. The ceiling was high, but also wore the same shining black. It almost made the room feel larger, yet somehow claustrophobic. There was a figure sitting on an elegant throne at the end of the room. He was quite small, compared to everything else I'd seen. The throne also looked closer to something from the real world. It was adorned in gold filigree, while the seat was cushioned in a dark, velvet-like material. I wondered if more of you would make it here. My own voice called out to me. I was stunned as my mirror image jumped down from the tall chair to walk towards me. The creature who had carried me all this way twisted its head around to look down at the other me. My doppelganger gave a nod, to which my taxi softly set me down on the floor before turning to stroll back out of the room. I stared at the man in front of me. He looked just like me, aside from his long, dark hair, which looked as though it hung down to the middle of his back with a single braid on one side. He was in much better shape than me. It looked as though he would do pretty well in a wrestling or boxing ring. He wore a suit vest with no shirt underneath, revealing his veined and muscled arms. His baggy blue jeans came down to some biker-style black leather boots. I wondered if this could be an alternate version of me who may have joined a metal band with a side gig in the UFC or something. What the hell is all this? I asked, staring into his dark eyes. Were my eyes that dark? I wondered. This, he said, holding his arms outstretched to the side, is my kingdom. But, but you're me. He started laughing a laugh that most definitely did not sound like mine. Is that what you see? He said, 
still laughing. All is not as it seems, my friend. What the actual fuck are you talking about? I said, a little more aggressively than I meant to, if I'm being honest. I was sure I did not want to piss this guy off, whatever he was. Manners, he said, turning his back to me, before pacing towards his throne. Would you believe me if I told you this was hell? Yes, I stuttered, suddenly feeling queasy. He started laughing again, so much that he actually buckled over, grabbing his side. Well, it's not, he said. Some may consider this a hell dimension, but it's not exactly hell, so to speak. Who were the people? I asked, mimicking regaining my composure, gesturing back down the hallway. He tilted his head as if questioning what I had said. The people that the big guy dragged down the other hall. Oh, he said. Don't mind them. They're just soulless. There are no actual people here. Well, other than you? I tilted my head this time. I was genuinely confused. Empty vessels. Nothing more. Sometimes they wander into our little town, but they're harmless. We just, well, keep them contained. You came through the intersection, yes? He asked, answering his own question. I nodded. How'd that feel? It... it didn't feel like anything, I replied. I wasn't entirely sure what he meant, but I hadn't noticed any particular sensation as I crossed from one road to another. It just turns dark. Of course it did, he said. There is no daylight here. What are you? I asked. I don't think I meant to be so forward. It just spilled out of my mouth. He just stared at me for a moment. It was as though he were studying my face, for one reason or another. Your mind cannot comprehend what I am, nor what this place is. He continued to glare at me. It wasn't until then that I noticed something entirely inhuman behind those dark eyes. D did you make the intersection? I hesitantly asked. His stare didn't waver. No, he said softly. But I would like to know who or what did. He continued gazing at me for some time, just staring at my face and into my eyes. The room had fallen almost intolerably silent. I could hear my own heartbeat thumping like a drum. I'd like to study you, he said, matter-of-factly, finally cutting his eyes from mine. S study me? He smiled. It was my face, my smile, but it disturbed me in ways I can't quite explain. No, that wasn't my smile at all. I didn't think my face contorted like that when I smiled. It was creepy as hell, truth be told. He waved his hand towards three humanoid, faceless creatures who shambled out from the darkness. Had they been here this whole time, or had they entered while I wasn't paying attention? Take him to the laboratory, he said in a commanding voice. Hey, stop, I yelled as they aggressively grabbed me by the arms. I will oversee the procedure myself, he said, completely ignoring my objections. Let me go. I screamed, struggling to break free. These things were strong. They barely moved as I flailed around, trying to break loose. The third of the beasts grabbed my legs before they began carrying me from the room as though they were moving a goddamn couch. They hauled me down another long and twisted hallway before taking a right into what I presumed to be the laboratory. It was a much smaller room than the one I talked to myself in, though still unnerving in its dimensions. The walls looked like a nightmare version of a public restroom. They were tiled in moldy, cream-colored, plate-like tiles, but chipped and cracked, while speckled with red and brown stains. The room's angles were just as bizarre as the rest of this town. One wall was taller than the other, but not in a similar manner as a vaulted ceiling in a cozy living room. The shapes did not appear to serve any purpose, nor did they remotely make any structural sense. The creatures tossed me into a cell at the back of the room, ignoring my protests still. They slammed the gate shut before shuffling back out of the room, 
Not so much as acknowledging my threats of some serious ass-whooping if I got free. In all honesty, I couldn't even take myself seriously on that. I rattled the uneven bars on my cage, belting out a mass of obscenities and threats, which did not end until I finally kicked the door before dropping to the cold, concrete floor. Sometime later, I would realize how much that hurt, but at that point, all I knew was that I was exhausted and terrified of what was to come. I sat there, panting and swearing, punching the ground until my hand began to throb. It was around then that I started to really take in my surroundings. It looked like something out of a horror movie. There were several tables in the center of the room, each with straps for binding victims in place, some with bodies still upon them. There were racks of various nasty-looking instruments and tools to the side of the rows of tables. The floor beneath the tables was metallic and grated, with fresh blood still trickling through from one of the tables. The bodies looked like they had been operated on, though not in a manner which would suggest any attempt to save the patients. Heads had been sawed open, exposing the brain. Torsos were sliced into, while some had been completely hollowed out. Some hands and feet had been removed, while others had large sections of flesh missing in various places. What exactly was the point of all this? What questions could possibly be answered by such butchery? I got to my feet in an attempt to get a better look at the bodies, though my stomach was in knots and I could feel the lump in my throat strongly considering boiling over. It should have surprised me, I thought, but it didn't. All of the bodies which were carved open, sliced, diced, and strewn apart were mine. Seven in all. Seven different varieties of me who, I assume, had made their own way down the same road with the same red trees. In all honesty, the grotesque sight of the dissected bodies did not scare me as much as the horrified, wide-eyed expressions of the seven copies of my face. Study me, he had said. Here I was, hoping it would just be a friendly Q&A session. Fuck me. I sighed aloud. Moments later, a light flickered from a window high above the tables, overlooking the lab. Sure enough, Rockstar Me was glaring through as two tall, thin men came into the room. They appeared somewhat human, though their grayish flesh and small, dark eyes would suggest otherwise. They were almost reminiscent of cartoon science with their long lab coats and rubber gloves. They even had those comic-style round mirror things strapped to their heads. It made me think of how a surgeon may look to a scared and imaginative child. One of them strolled over to my cell before sliding a long, crooked key into the lock. The door creaked open with a squeal, which only added to the horror movie motif. The others shuffled up before they grabbed my hands to pull me from the cage. I didn't put up a fight, but I could tell these two were not as strong as the ones who initially dragged me into this room. They led me to the table closest to the cell. My heart raced with fearful anticipation, combined with the knowledge that I had to do something. I wasn't about to allow myself to be sliced apart like my stunt doubles while they rooted around my insides to find whatever it was they were searching for. I played the role of the victim, sobbing, begging, and pleading for them to grant me freedom. Show my weakness. Show them I am not a threat. Truth be told, the sobs were real. I was beyond terrified of the possibilities. As we approached a vacant table, they released their grip on my arms, while gesturing for me to hop on and lay down. They only wanted to fillet me, after all. No reason for me not to comply. I turned to the table, before glancing up at my shredded doppelganger staring down from the window high above. He moved closer to the glass, placing his palms upon it. I gave him a quick smirk and a wink as I turned to kick one of the surgeons in the ass as hard as I could. It slammed against the table across from the one I had been butchered on, toppling over the side of it. As the other came at me, I ducked down to ram my shoulder into its gut, causing it to hit the ground with a thump. The other me pounded on the glass, and I could hear him scream out before he disappeared from view. I ran to the rack of tools beside the rows of tables, reaching for a long and jagged saw. It had a pistol-type grip with a decent weight to it. 
the two doctor creatures had gotten to their feet and charged at me. Again, I ducked down, this time swiping the blade against one of their midsections, spilling yellowish-green blood out, as well as what I assumed to be intestines, onto the floor. The other dodged to the side as I swung the blade at him, but I managed to catch him across the throat with my following attack. Its neck split open, oozing more gruesome fluids, dropping the thing to the floor while it fought to hold the gaping wound shut. Without lingering to be sure it would not succeed in ceasing the flow of blood, I quickly fled the room. I had no idea where to go, nor how to escape this maddening place, but I was sure as shit going to try my damnedest to free myself from this nightmare. I heard a bellowing howl coming from the other end of the hall on the left, from where it led to the throne room. This was my way out. There may be another exit down one of these other halls, but the building looked massive from the outside. The last thing I needed was to get lost in a place like this, especially with my very own Mr. Hyde in pursuit. So, I ran straight as fast as my trembling legs could carry me. The ground shook as that ginormous, muscled beast who had led the soulless to whatever doom this place had in store for them came charging up the hall towards me. He was big. I can dodge big. He was fast, though. I had never been much of a fighter, it just wasn't my scene. I never felt the need to show anyone I was tougher than them, nor had I ever found myself in a situation where I had to defend myself or anyone else. I was running on pure instinct as I raced down the twisted hallway. Pure instinct, along with the desire to make it out of this world in one piece. I bounded from side to side as the beast approached. I didn't know if it would work, but straight at him would only get me killed. He lunged at me on the left, so I leapt to the right. He was so focused on his target, he slammed right into the wall. I would neither slow down nor turn to see if it got back on its feet. To my surprise, I arrived back at the throne room to find it empty. I didn't waste any time reveling in that fact, though. I kept charging for the exit, running for the long hallway which led out to this place. I heard a sound from behind me I could never hope to repeat, nor whether I could even describe it. It almost sounded like a newborn baby crying for food, combined with a Tyrannosaurus Rex experiencing the worst diarrhea imaginable. It immediately caused my legs to turn gelatinous beneath me, dropping me to the ground, clutching my ears. I looked back to see the other me running at me, his clothes ripped as his body began to expand. His skin looked as though it had solidified, like rock, but not quite. Multiple arms and legs sprouted from his hardened flesh as he morphed before my eyes into something I could barely fathom. Light shone through from inside him, making him appear as though burning, glowing eyes glared out from somewhere within. He had grown so many limbs that it was hard to understand how he was able to move without tripping over himself. There was a blurry haze around him, making it impossible to focus on exactly what he was becoming. I was shaking all over. I had no strength. I could barely move, but he was getting closer, much faster than I ever thought possible. I pulled myself up onto my trembling noodles for legs and made my way down the hallway once more. I could feel his breath on my neck. I couldn't look back. My mind would not be able to handle the abomination he was transforming into. He could have been right behind me for all I knew, but I had to keep going. Many creatures were still inside the walls of this place, but they appeared to be running for the doors themselves. Clearly, they did not want to be in the path of this thing any more than I. I was running fast, faster than I think I have ever ran. Pain drove itself into my side like a spike carving through the flesh, but I wouldn't stop. I knew that if I let up for even a second, I would not survive this. I was only feet from the widened gate, though this would only be the first step in my escape. As I cleared the exit, something grabbed me, pulling me into the dark. I just knew it had gotten me. My vision had gone out, and I was fading from this world. Just not in the way I had hoped. You all right, kid? A familiar voice spoke in little more than a whisper. Uh, Ed? I said as he held a finger to my mouth. Ed? I repeated, whispering. Close enough. Still shocked at Ed's appearance out of the blue, I looked around to see where my pursuers were. It didn't feel as though I had been pulled far after escaping through the gates. Everything appeared almost foggy, 
as if I was peering through tinted glass. They won't be able to see us. We're camouflaged in here, he said, swirling his finger in a circle above his head. In here? It's a kind of bubble. Helps me move around places I don't want to be seen. What is this place? I asked, disregarding the bubble topic for the time being. This is his world, he replied, gesturing towards the multi-limbed beast as it came charging through the open gate. It was angry. Very angry. Luckily, the bubble I found myself concealed within also dulled the sounds from outside. The creature's screams still caused me to feel sick to my stomach, but not as much as they did in full surround sound. Other monsters and beasts were attempting to flee as the horrendous monstrosity continued its rampage. It swatted at nearby creatures if any were unfortunate enough to not clear a path, causing them to careen to the side as though they had been struck by a wrecking ball. They slammed into walls, impaled on jagged fences, or soared over rooftops. A gruesome configuration of varying colors of blood flooded across the road, like a mixture of acrylic paints blending into the painter's desired tone. I just gazed out at this madness, with my mouth agape once more. That boy's a spoiled brat having a tantrum, Ed remarked, shaking his head. Who? I mean, what is he? That there is a Kakaron, and he's bad news, he said, still looking out at the rampaging behemoth. So, what is he? Uh, some sort of demon? Not a demon, no. That's a new word. He's been around since long before demons. He made it sound like he was a kid or something. To me, he is, he replied, still not looking away from the commotion. We stood in silence for a moment, until I asked, How old are you? He looked down at me, his head slightly cocked. I mean, if he's ancient and he's like a child to you... I had become comfortable around Ed, but I was suddenly feeling very small. I ain't no spring chicken, kid. He put his hand on my shoulder as if to reassure me not to be intimidated by him, though it couldn't be helped at this point, but it was a nice gesture nonetheless. We better get moving, Ed said, making a strained expression. Takes a lot of focus to keep this thing up while moving, especially with two on board. You better drive. I wasn't exactly sure what he meant by that, but when he just nodded in the direction I had entered this world from, I started walking. I kept my pace slow, as to not bump into anything or otherwise blow our cover, so to speak. I could not see any sign of the beast, only the destruction he had left in his wake. We were not making fast progress, but we stayed consistent. The ground was moist and sticky. The blends of different styles and colors of blood reacted with the strangely textured ground in a fascinating way. It actually looked quite pretty, though gruesome. We were approaching the token diner I'd been carried past upon my arrival in this slice of hell, or whatever it was, when I saw my discarded dirt bike still on its side next to the road. Across from it stood Kakaron, back in his freshly dry-cleaned me suit. We stopped moving, standing in silence, staring at the man with my face for a moment, when Ed started to speak once more. Listen, kid. When this starts, you grab your bike and make for the other end of town as fast as you can. Don't look back, you hear? I was confused for a second. The other side of town? I asked. Don't we need to get back to the fork? He looked down at me with eyes both wide and sympathetic. Your world's on the other side, he said. This is his world, kid. This ain't one of the alternates glued together by the intersection. He's a shapeshifter, a trickster, you see. I studied him for a moment, tracing my eyes across his leather textured skin and back to meet his gaze. He's obsessed with the intersection, has been for a long time. 
When it turns up, and if he can find it, he parks that little dome of reality right at the mouth of one of the roads, pushing the one that's there back a ways, and he just waits. He can't cross it himself, you see. Way he's made just don't allow it. I think that's why he's so determined to find out what it is. He carves up and experiments on anyone who's unfortunate enough to stumble into this place. It always looks different here, though. Kinda depends on the mood he's in, I suppose. But the trees are always red. I wasn't sure what to say, even if I could find the words. You get that bike and don't look back, no matter what you hear. The bubble faded before my eyes, returning the tinted reality back to full color again, now in HD. The thing wearing my face just stared at us with pure hatred in his eyes. You no more. He spat with contempt. The words croaked from his mouth as his body began to contort again. I should have known you had a hand in this. As the humanoid torso began to morph once more, the sound of his bones shifting combined with the tearing fabric of his clothes as twisted fingers tore their way through. Udamor, formerly known as Et, cut his eyes to me. Go. You're not going to fight him, are you? Ed had saved my life more than once over the last few days. I didn't want him to get hurt, or killed for that matter. He just gave me that smile again. But I've never seen anything like him before. You ain't never seen nothing like me, neither. He said with a broad and slightly manic smile, with a glowing green fire behind his eyes. He casually strolled towards his foe, unbuttoning his long trench coat. He dropped it down from his shoulders, rolling his neck as he pulled the hat from his head. Thick, white hair poured down onto his back like water from a glass. Muscles bulged from his neck and shoulders. They grew, bulging into veined, rippled boulders, stretching his leather skin. His body expanded as though it was some sort of muscled balloon being pumped full of sweet oxygen. His legs swelled, tearing through the fabric of his brown pants, while his feet practically burst through the shoes, which now lay fragmented on the ground behind him. He raised himself up, standing twice the height he had before. His body was lined with scars, doubtlessly from centuries of battles etched into his skin. He stood as a colossus before me, like a titan from legends of old. He charged towards his enemy while I ran from my bike. The ground shook with his footfalls. It felt as though I was running through an earthquake to reach shelter. As I pulled my bike from the ground, the two made contact. The shockwave launched me to the ground before I wrestled my way back to the bike once more. I pulled it up from the blackened silver floor once again and mounted my steed. I wanted to look. I wanted to make sure my friend was still holding his own, but I followed Ed's words, squealing my tires as I took off. I pushed the gas as hard as I could, refusing to look back towards the sound of the raging battle. The ground trembled with fury every time one of them made contact with the other. I could hear the sounds of enormous boulders swinging against one another like a pendulum. The accompanying noises caused my heart to thunder within my chest. Sounds of buckets of thick liquid being spilled onto the ground, as if a giant water balloon filled with ketchup had just been blown apart. Don't look back. I can't look back. Eyes forward, kid. I could hear Ed call softly into my ear. Was it my mind's eye revisiting his advice, or was he still coaching me along? My giant bodyguard, my friend. Buildings burned while chaos reigned around me, but I would not let up. Screams and moans echoed from behind me as I cleared the silhouettes of buildings to see only the scarlet trees on either side of me. I won't stop. I can't stop. I'm coming home like Major fucking Tom. The sounds of battle, squeals, and crumbling buildings fell silent. Red gave way to green. The world fell still once more. I screeched my tires to a halt as the fresh air of my home world slapped me in the face like rain to a drought. The sky was still dark. 
Had I really made it home, or was I still in the other place? Perhaps it was just night time. There was no real way to tell how long I'd been gone. My cell phone battery had died many miles back, so I had no way of checking if I could reconnect to the towers it had left behind. I slowly turned the bike around to see no sign of my silver Nissan, only a single two-lane road. No fork, no intersection. I rolled my bike over the curb before turning the key to allow the engine to rest for a bit. I stomped my feet a few times as a white pickup truck flew by. The driver glared out of his passenger side window at me as though I were dancing an Irish jig. I just laughed as he rode off into the distance, down the road I had come from. There were no red trees in sight. I could only hope that I was truly back where I belonged, as it would appear the door was now shut. I took a seat on a tree stump near the side of the road. I was excited to head back to my apartment, while nervously apprehensive to make sure I was where I was meant to be, but I also hoped I would see a sign of Ed strolling up the road towards me. I doubted that it would be possible, to be honest. It looked as though there was no longer a way to access the world in which I had left him fighting for his life and mine, but I couldn't leave. Not yet. Just a few minutes more. Maybe thirty minutes passed, and I was growing more and more restless. It was time for me to get on my way, back to the world I hoped was mine. I hopped back on my bike and started down the road. The needle on the fuel gauge was hovering slightly above empty, so I needed to get a fill up soon, or I would be walking again. After a few miles, I noticed the diner on my left. Though I was halfway tempted to pull over to make sure the employees spoke English, I needed to get to a gas station as soon as possible. Moments later, I saw the familiar gas and sip on the side of the road, just down from the stop sign. I pulled up to the pump and began absentmindedly feeding my starving dirt bike. When I walked into the store to pay, I was happy to see that my money didn't raise any eyebrows. After heading back out, I slipped a few quarters into the newspaper vending machine before leafing through the paper to see if there was anything about a murdered young woman fitting Ruby's description. I sighed in relief when I saw nothing more alarming than a local church bake sale advertisement along with the average yet slightly depressing news articles. I walked around the side of the building and leaned against the outside wall as to not get in anyone's path. It was late. According to the clock in the gas station, it was about 4.30 a.m., but I still thought it best to stay out of the way. I flipped through the newspaper for a time. It had been a long time since I had read one of these, and I was honestly curious if they still contained the daily comics. How's the stock market looking? I heard a deep, southern accent speak. My heart skipped a beat as I raised my head to see Ed leaning against my beat-up silver Nissan. The windshield was still gone, and the front end was beat up pretty good, but he had somehow gotten it here. I ran to him and wrapped my arms around him, not even taking the time to make sure that was acceptable to someone or something like him. He winced slightly, but wrapped his arms around me nonetheless. Are you okay? I asked, truly thrilled to see him still in one piece. No worse for wear. His expression seemed strained, somehow, and he appeared to be a little more hunched over now. I suddenly felt ashamed for attacking him with a hug when he looked as though he may be in some degree of pain. Is he dead? I asked, with a slight tremor in my voice. No, Ed replied with a crooked smile. But he's gonna be out of the game for a good while. We just stood, staring at each other for a moment. My heart was beating quickly but not from fear this time. My mind was still reeling from everything that had happened. How can I ever thank you? I said, staring up into Ed's eyes. Y you saved my life, multiple times. Nothing to thank me for, kid, he replied, smiling. I was in the area. How did you get out of there? The road was closed. I, I mean, it sealed shut behind me, I, I think. I wasn't entirely sure how to put it, so it surely sounded like an odd thing to say. I ain't bound by the same rules as him, 
We come from a similar place that's older than both of us combined, but I don't need a playhouse to get around. We stood in silence again. The breeze felt wonderful. Judging by the look on Ed's face, he was thinking the same. After a time, he raised himself up, stretching his arms, causing a series of cracks and pops. He clapped me on the shoulder, holding his hand in place for a moment. Reckon I better be moving along. Folks may start to stare if I stick around these parts too long. I stood up straight, holding my hand out to shake his. You changed my life, Ed, I said, genuinely grateful for how much he had helped me in finding my way home. As he wrapped his long fingers around my hand again, it didn't feel as strange as it did the first time. Maybe it was simply that all of the abnormal things I witnessed have somehow changed my perspective on things. Perhaps it was just that I saw Ed as a friend now, and not an unnerving stranger in the darkness. I feel like I see things differently now. Before all this, I wasn't exactly a good person, I think. I sat, unsure of where exactly this moment of bearing my soul was coming from. I'm not the same man I was before. I hope that I'm not, anyway. Ed just looked back at me, still wearing his smirking smile. We've all made mistakes, kid. We've all got stuff we wish we can get back and change, but they all make us what we are. In the end, sometimes you gotta see the grit behind the surface to see how beautiful the world really can be. He looked out into the world, as if to breathe it in. You might start to forget a lot of things over the next few days, he said, still gazing into the beyond. The human mind ain't made to hold these kinds of things in. But what about all I've learned? What about you? I can't forget you or what you did for me. He looked down into my eyes. It felt like he was looking through them, straight into the old brain pan again. It'll all still be there. Just push to the back. Can't rightly say if you'll remember me or not. Ain't an exact science. Can't rightly say what'll still stay on the surface and what'll be packed up and moved into storage. He chuckled, seemingly amused by his own analogy. He smiled an almost mischievous grin. You're gonna be a bit more cautious when you see a fork in the road. That's for damn sure. We both laughed at that. I think it was the first time I'd heard him swear, for that matter. He turns to me, laying a hand on my shoulder. You take care now, kid. I gripped his hand on my shoulder and held tears back that threatened to start flowing again. See you around? He turns and began to stroll away, limping slightly on his left leg. Never can tell, kid. As he moved closer to the road ahead, one last thought hit me. Wait, I called out. He turns to face me. There was this uh, building in that other place. I'm not entirely sure why I found it so urgent to ask him about this. Something about this place still had me feeling uneasy. Strangely more so than the creepy little pocket world with the red trees. It was up on the hill and it was huge, massive. It didn't look like anything else that was there. It was like a glossy black or something... It seems to. My words were cut short when he darted back to me in an instant before I could even blink. It seemed to call out to you, he said, finishing my sentence. He looked at me with a strange frown across his brow. He looked concerned, almost frightened. That place is a corruption, a temptation, an abomination, he said almost growling the words. It belongs to the old ones, the ones that came before. It's older than anything you or even I could even know. He stared deep into my eyes. You ever see that place again, you get as far away from that as you can. Don't never go near it, and don't you ever think about going inside. You hear me? He spoke, almost as if he was lecturing his child though far more agitated. It'll try to pull you in. If you've seen it, it's sure enough seen you too. He grabbed my shoulder tightly. 
Do you hear me? He asked through gritted teeth. Uh, yeah, I hear you, Ed, I said, softly, feeling suddenly more intimidated by my friends than I had even at first. His words shook me, and the tone of his voice cut into me like a hot knife. He loosened his grip on my shoulder. After a moment, his face softens back up, and the glint returns to his kind eyes. Some places ain't fit for no one, kid. You've earned a second chance in life. You've had a peek behind the curtain that you weren't ever meant to see. He was gently rubbing my shoulder as if to console me. There are things out there ain't nobody supposed to see. You steer clear of that place, you hear? I nodded my head and almost whispered. Yeah, yes, I hear you, Ed. He gave me a wide smile while patting my shoulder one last time before turning around to resume his stroll towards the road. You take care of yourself, cowboy, I called out. He was right at the side of the road, turning to face me once more, tipping two fingers to his hat, giving me a half salute. He smiled at me for a moment before his eyes became wide and he suddenly pointed a finger at something behind me. I whipped my whole body around to see what it was. My heart raced as I instantly pictured Kakaron standing right behind me, but I felt like an idiot when I turned to see the same wall I had been leaning against only moments before. I turned back to the road, chuckling to myself as I knew Ed would be gone. Sure enough, the road was empty, and nobody was in sight. Goodbye, my friend. I spoke to the air in front of me. To my surprise, my car cranked right up, though the front end was still buckled. I couldn't help but wonder how Ed had been able to bring it back to me, but many things about him would remain a mystery to me. Before I hit the roads to head back home, I asked the gas station attendant if he would mind if I let my dirt bike parked there for a bit. It had been my trusty steed and saved my life on more than one occasion. I still felt bad for the kid I had stolen it from, but there was no way for me to return it now, and I did not want to let it go. The guy behind the cash register nodded, and I would come back for it later the following day. Dawn was breaking as I drove the familiar road on my aggressively shuddering wheels. When I got back to my apartment, I found Ruby sleeping on my bed, wrapped up in one of my sweatshirts. I sat beside the bed for a while, just watching her sleep. After a while, she began to stir, blinking her eyes open. She leapt to me, even in her half-awake state. She wrapped her arms around me, sobbing almost uncontrollably, as she asked me where I had been all this time. As it turned out, I had been gone for a solid week. In some ways, it didn't feel like I had been gone for that long, but in other ways, so much longer. Over the following days, she and I did a lot of talking. She cried and asked me to forgive her for being unfaithful, while I sobbed and apologized for being an uncaring, self-consuming prick. We were both at fault for how far off the rails our relationship had gotten, but we wanted to work through it. Before the brain fog could take my memories of the intersection away, I wrote a lot of this down. I wanted it to be fresh, so I could always turn back to these pages if it all vanished. Over the next few years, I turned my life around. I quit my awful job, officially this time, and started painting again, as something I hadn't done since high school. I found I had acquired a whole new vision on color theory due to my time in the other place. Ruby supported me the whole way. She worked and paid the bills while I found my artistic streak again. Only one year at it, and a woman from a gallery in the city came to see my work. Ruby had bumped into her at her job, and as it turned out, they had known each other in college. She was so impressed by my work, she insisted on displaying it in her gallery. I sold my first painting to a wealthy business owner for $75,000. I hadn't even given it a price or thoughts of selling. He just approached me and belted the offer at me like an enthusiastic demand. Who was I to refuse? The painting, simply titled My Guardian, now hangs in the man's estate. He even stays in contact with me, 
occasionally buying more of my work, while reporting the entire history of the glee others have felt at viewing my paintings. It's been three years now since the most bizarre week of my life changed me for the better. As predicted, I remember very little of the events, but I still see excerpts in my dreams. I do, however, still remember Ed. I'm glad of that fact, along with so many others. Ruby and I married and moved into a beautiful loft apartment in the city, far away from any forests which may or may not contain red trees. My paintings had provided everything we could ever need, but she still likes to work. She likes to stay busy, though she plans to take some significant time off when our daughter is born. We are due to become parents around three months from now. I love my life now, something I may never have achieved had I not crashed into the mysterious fork in the road. Sometimes when I look into Ruby's big green eyes, feeling my heart still swell with my love for her, I remember that they used to be brown. Sometimes I think it's just the brain fog altering the way things used to be in the back of my mind. Other times, I wonder if the world I live in now may have been one last gift from Ed, my friend, my guardian. <laughs>